so much for attending this second part of the Learned Society's discussion session. Since some of you may not have been present in our earlier one, we're going to do a, just a quick round of introductions. But again, you are here for more Learned so Society's discussion. So um, in the event that uh, there's another panel that you'd like to um, attend, please do feel free to pop out. Um, so we have, in the order of seating, Yes, we, we have to my right. Um, Alex Vance. Alex Vance, the executive, <laughs> <laughs> the executive director of Geoscience World. Um, she was one of the plenaries, and we hope um, we will be digging in a little bit more into the themes that she brought up yesterday. And we also have Catherine Cotton, the chief executive of the Federation of European Microbiological Microbiolo Societies, um, or FEMS for short as well as Sally Hardy, the CEO of Regional Studies Association. So in the session, we'll be diving into the question of building economies of scale in learned societies to meet the demands of expanding constituencies, changing community needs, um, ever-pressing um, economic challenges. How might we achieve what we'll talk about, our vertical and horizontal scale? Um, and this is, this concept is, um, is largely inspired by Michael Clark's blog post called The Changing Nature of Scale in STM and Scholarly Publishing, which I do encourage you to find online, where he describes two visual idioms that can serve as very powerful metaphors for us, the horizontal and the vertical. So horizontal scale focus on, focuses on economies of scales that come with producing large numbers of the same type of product, okay? And in publishing, it's oriented around production and distribution. Um, whereas vertical scale focuses on the types of benefits that come with selling different types of products to the same customer base. And vertical scale in publishing here is mostly oriented around marketing. Um, and it's vertical in the sense that marketing professionals refer to sectors or niches in the market as market verticals. Um, these, I think, are two very interesting concepts to play with, which we'll want to think about and percolate. But I think the broader question is really about what type of reduction in resource investments for individual learned societies, where they may overlap, and where also combined investments amongst multiple parties, learned societies, might achieve greater yields. And this, I just want to point out, most definitely includes the publishing operations for the learned societies, but as they serve many, many roles, if you were a part of the previous session, you will have heard a bit about, um, to those as well. What type of expertise domains, knowledge resources, et cetera, might be shared and therefore capitalized on as a collective? And here we're talking about more broadly speaking than the question of cooperation versus that of working independently, say then in isolation of one another. There are definitely trade-offs um, and gains. So um, I th I w I'm hoping that we will get to some of, not only the gains, but also some of the trade-offs that, that we face. Mm -hmm. Here, I'll open it up to the, our, our three experts just to talk a little bit, a bit about how, as a learned society, are you partnering with other publishers to achieve either the vertical or the horizontal? And in Alex's case, as a party that is supporting this, um, in what ways are, are you seeing this happen very effectively? Right. Well, I mean, I talked about this fairly extensively yesterday, which is that, you know, what I do as a secondary publisher is that I, you know, bring together a bunch of societies who have some like interest, like activity, uh, commonality. I talked about the track record of what we've done so far, and then I talked about where I think you know, the changing market opens up opportunities to do additive things. Um, I actually was going to target Michael over there in the back corner, <coughs> just because he looked like he was about to leave. Um, but one of the questions that came <laughs> up in the <laughs> still here in the earlier session was someone had asked. What has actually changed? Someone said, you know, what has happened in open access? Have people gone out of business? Has, has this happened? That Michael wrote that article about vertical and horizontal um, scale in 2015. And so one of the questions that I would raise is how have the market conditions changed during that period to actually make this issue of particularly horizontal scale more um, pressing now? Um, the other person who is happily in the room is John Inglis, who's been working on 
preprint servers. And I've had a number of conversations with John about that. This is another example where people can endeavor to build things themselves. They can do that separately. They could do that collectively. These are just the kinds of examples. I think Michael had said in open access, in that article he said, you know, open access favors scale even more than subscription publishing favors scale. So who is in a better position to do that? Well, commercial publishers, arguably. Um, individual societies, a little less so. So all of these things kind of give rise to ideas of you know, with whom are we competing? It used to be I have the fabulous society of this and you have the fabulous society of that and we're across the street from each other. Let's compete. <laughs> you know, we're either different enough or we're, or we're competing with one another. But I would argue that now we have to look at a landscape where it's much harder as individual societies of different sizes to continue to thrive in our own businesses, but the threats are potentially uh, larger and external. Thank you. Well, um, I think. Do oh, you want to keep going? Yes, before we're going to we keep go, going. And then we'll come back and, to you. And we will yeah. definitely pick up on this. Yeah. I, th I think I'd like to keep going in part because we have examples here of two organizations that are, in fact, consortium or co cooperatives made up of multiple individual groups, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so um, as I said in the previous session, uh, our organization is a federation of microbiological societies. Um, we're the federating body and we have our own journals and, and several of our members also have uh, journals. Um, we, in the process of looking at business development and how we might uh, diversify revenues, started doing some uh, benchmarking and analysis of um, comparable organizations. And from what we've been able to understand, publishing with a commercial publisher is hugely um, cost efficient for an organization like ours. We have five journals, not 50 journals. Um, and publishing with, at the moment, um, Oxford University Press, who are doing a fantastic job, thank you. Um, they uh, bring us an economy of scale, which we wouldn't be able to bring. Um, at the same time, because our memberships journals are spread over five, I think, um, publishers, including at least one that's self-publishing, we sort of lose other aspects of economy of scale, where if we, were, if we were the collection of one commercial publisher, we would have a very different situation. On the other hand, because we are spread over a number of publishers, that actually brings some opportunities. So we've started doing a number of things like virtual special issues with our member societies, so that we have five commercial publishers um, cross-promoting content at our Congress, for example. And these are very small steps, um, but they themselves demonstrate our membership overcoming the sort of mental barrier of competing with mm. each other. So the very fact that we've been able to produce these virtual special issues, we've done two now, um, with increasing enthusiasm from the membership is already the start of significant change. So I think there's potential there. I didn't know about geoscience world until yesterday, so I'm pretty excited now uh, <laughs> that this can exist. Uh, we've, been, we've been looking at, is it possible to, um, to do this kind of um, collaboration? So uh, I'm the chief exec of a, a medium-sized learned society. We're not part of um, a federation. Um, we use multipliers, though, in the same way that I think your members do. So um, myself and many of my, my colleagues of similar, uh, running similar societies would use our commercial publishers as a multiplier. Um, so we expect from that um, economies of scale in terms of um, the publishing expertise, the marketing expertise, the portal on which the, um, the journals are displayed. Um, we also use um, an umbrella body as a means of um, collaboration. So most of us would be members of the Academy for Social Science. They have a chief executives forum, which is extremely active. Um, we don't have a tradition so much of um, working very closely in partnership with each other. There was some research done um, by the Research Information Network that showed that in social sciences, there are very few subdisciplinary societies. So there isn't really a tradition of societies working in collaboration. We're, we're, we're relatively <coughs> separate. What we are good at is sharing ideas because we're not directly in competition. 
as I said in the earlier session, I think, I think as societies are beginning to reposition themselves and are starting to look covetously at other areas that they might bring in, either new and emerging areas or areas that are on the interstices between two societies, we may find ourselves moving to a time when um, societies feel a sense of competition more, more, um, more keenly than we currently do. Um, I think the idea of virtual issues across societies is, um, is one that I will definitely take away from this. I can see lots and lots of really good reasons why we might want to do that. Um, and perhaps the Academy of Social Science might be a way of um, facilitating that. I'll leave it at that. Wonderful. Um, are there any other partnerships that you in the audience representing learned societies or those who support learned, um, learned societies are involved in? which might achieve or take the shape, very similar shape of these vertical and horizontal economies of scale. So let's dig in more to the question that Alex has posed. Um, Michael, do you remember yeah. what it was? Um, <laughs> well, I have, two, I have two questions actually that I'll just punt right out there. And one was, what has changed, let's just say in the last two, three years, or, or kind of begun to come to more into fruition or focus that um, that probably should prompt some different activities. Um, the other question, sort of parallel question, is what kinds of activities, now I think of it mostly in the publishing spectrum, um, are more primed for collaboration, probably for reasons of economy and business competitiveness. Does that make sense? Question. Um, I, you know, I think the mar the horizontal the market's gotten more horizontal than yeah. it was even two years ago. I think that's mm -hmm. the um, I, you know I don't it's not it's a continued change more th more than anything. G um, sorry, can you explain g give, explain what that means specifically? What types of things are getting bundled into this horizontal? Well, yeah. well I think the big deal has gotten bigger, um, and it's, it's gotten more entrenched, and there's now um, starting to be more well in part in part driven by uh, flat library budgets okay. um, and you know so the publishers are um, under pressure to um, keep their big deals um, uh, in there uh, in the library and, and to become um, you know uncancelable so, so to speak so um, if, if I might yeah, in the in the big deals right and if library budgets are essentially flat academic budgets at least and what you end up, what I feel like we're seeing, is the larger players doing more to compete with each other. It's all takeaway money, right? There's no new money there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what does that mean? Who is even eligible for jockeying for those same dollars? And I think, I think that's what you're saying in terms of um, horizontal competition. Well, that, that's right. The and then on the other yeah. side, libraries have um, reacted by escalating their scale by, by forming mm -hmm. library consortias. Um, so the deals just get um, bigger and bigger. And now um, it's interesting that open access is coming into play um, in some of these, these big deals, um, meaning APCs as well as, mm -hmm. as well as subscriptions, so the, yeah. the, which has opened a whole, I think, new front in, in um, horizontal scale. Well, we, you know, uh, GSW recently commissioned a report from Delta Think using their open access tool. But one of the things that was really interesting to me is what surfaced is, you know, there's also this mechanism for collecting APCs, but, but who can go to an institution and do that? Again, only the really largest people. One of the things that's changed for GSW, what I'm hearing from some of the societies is, <coughs> in our model, societies could do their own selling, and they can sell through our aggregate as a, as a combined package. But I think relatively newly, what we're seeing is these smaller societies just can't get, I mean, they just can't get a meeting anymore, right? They can't sell their own things. So in that case, their only choices are to be with a nonprofit aggregate such as GSW, um, or you know, increasingly to go to a commercial publishing bundle. And, and you know, a different question is what's the long-term implication of making those choices? Are those different choices? Um, and then we have some of the mid-sized publishers who can still effectively sell their own content independently. But that's one sort of change, and we're seeing it at the small society end right mm -hmm. now. But how do we view that arc continuing is one of the things we're looking at. 
Uh, shall I just jump in to say yeah. that? I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, when open access first kind of burst onto the scene in 2013 in the UK, um, I was holding a board meeting actually in Beijing of my, of my international board, and one of the board members said, it's brilliant, we don't need commercial publishers. And, and I felt really shocked um, that, that somebody would, would think that an organisation the size of mine with the kind of um, in, international global footprint that we have, which is, which is disproportionate to the size of the staff team, I was shocked that somebody would think that we could effectively manage that publishing process without our commercial partner in our, in our, pub our publishing partner. That there is no way we could manage to do all of those things um, without our commercial um, publisher. And I have seen over the last few, few months um, two societies come to me and talk to me about what it's like to publish with um, one of the big one of the big publishers we publish with Taylor and Francis and what that means about the values of the association so if they were self-publishing and they were moving to publish with a commercial publisher how does that relationship work and do the commercial publisher support the values and the mission statement of the association um, and, and I think for the for, for the smaller societies that really don't have a choice about self-publishing um, Getting the, the publishers to work with us as proper partners rather than suppliers is absolutely critical. That's what's really important to me as a chief executive, that my, my publishing partner understands where I'm coming from and understands what's important and understands that we're a values-driven organisation. And um, at, the, at the risk of repeating myself from the earlier session, you were talking about... Oh, sorry, you were talking about the new pot of money. Where's the new money? Mm -hmm. I was talking earlier about the fact that as a federation we are a microcosm of the scholarly se sector. So if we're competing with each other for resources then we're sure. being inefficient and we're not serving the scholarly communities that we're um, supporting mm -hmm. as, as well as we might. So we have a loss from what I consider the system mm -hmm. of money. So how do we bring more money in? Um, and that comes back again to this issue of recognition for different types of content. Until we get recognition for different types of content, we're unlikely to be able to um, channel the expertise of, of the, um, the academic community who would be the authors into um, areas where, for example, different organisations and different types of organisations might be willing to, to um, pay for APCs, mm -hmm. for example. So again, we're looking at small models of how can we use related infrastructure. So we're a scholarly society, there's a professional organisations which meet the practitioner audiences, um, which complement the expertise that we bring. So for me, an obvious example would be something like the International Water Association. We're not working with them, but we have 30,000 microbiologists, and then if you count um, the American society as well, we've got 60,000 microbiologists who know something about water security. Um, and then the International Water Association have three million individual practitioners around the world who receive their uh, communications. They also have their own suite of journals, obviously. Um, but how do, we, how do we use this existing infrastructure to build uh, a more coherent, joined up infrastructure that makes better use of the resources that we do have. This comes back to that question mm -hmm. that I asked earlier about, is it always more or can we to some extent do more with what we have already? Um, and so this is, you know, there's a number of questions in here. How do the different platforms link? Well, you're already um, mm -hmm. a long way with that. Uh, and how do we, um, join and then um, mobilise this kind of bigger network of producers and users of different types of content. And shared infrastructure, I think, is such an important notion there, because what we're talking about, when we started at scale, and then we talked about, it's about efficiency, right? None of us can afford to be inefficient. <laughs> shared infrastructure is, is one way that can be accomplished, right? And probably we've only started to scratch the surface of that. I mean, I think within commercial publishing entities, that's something that they leverage. But, you know, there are other ways to do it as well. And we talked about, so using 
shared sales vehicles, but they're also um, shared vehicles for innovation. And so, you know, when I pointed to, when I called out, you know, John English, I just think of that as one example. Um, Preprint servers, you know, have been on the rise and of, of interest and become part of the publishing workflow. Um, you see, and they started in, you know, physics and, and the biological sciences and so forth, but one of the questions was, well, should, you know, me, should I in chemistry do one myself? Should I in geoscience do one here and, and do one there? When we do that, I mean, is that antithetical to the idea of sharing infrastructure? Why would I do that? So um, now, each of those are fairly substantial domains. So the kind of the question that I'm posing is, is I, you know, I speak from a place very much of society independence, um, because I believe each society should be thriving with a lot of its own kind of original contributions. But to the degree that we're engaging in other activities, let's make sure that we're doing it with maximal efficiency, um, the least amount of loss, so that we can continue to thrive just because we're in a, a market situation and we can't do otherwise. Um, so those are some of the questions I'm curious about. I'll throw in a, um, a different way of looking at this. You know, we run learned societies. Um, what we've talked about in this session is, is sharing and collaborating around stuff. Mm -hmm. preprint servers and sales teams and mm -hmm. um, actually what learned societies committees and boards spend a lot of time talking about is ideas and I think where probably <coughs> there is a um, probably there is a, um, a lot further for us to go in the way in which we pose questions so we face um, wicked problems in the world um, the United Nations has set out their sustainability questions um, learned societies don't work very well with those because we tend to all have our own take on, on how these problems should be solved. It does seem to me that there's room for collaboration across the, so the yeah. societies in the way in which we tackle these large societal problems and that behind that comes a different kind of mm -hmm. um, economy of scale. Mm -hmm. um, so more multidisciplinary working, more, um, more international working um, across societies. And I think we shouldn't forget mm -hmm. yeah. that that's actually at the core of why learned societies are important to our members. Well, let's just take a second and spin this out. I think this is a very interesting um, channel. So what can you provide one actual example of a global question that, say, the United Nations has put forward um, that might be relevant to the Regional Studies Association? Well, I mean, they've, they've got their, their core challenges. The Regional Studies Association, for example, are interested in um, subnational development. So we might be interested in questions around um, how, you, how you help the economic development of um, a small region or a small urban area. Um, and traditionally, from our perspective, we would talk then about smart specialization, how you grow businesses around clusters of industry that's already within a small area. Um, where, where we could have help from other, from other disciplines, you have, there's a lot of psychology that goes into the way in which people begin to collaborate. Um, the, uh, the, there's a lot of urban sociologists that would be working on this from a slightly different place. The urban planners will be looking at the way in which you build concrete infrastructure in order to get people into these areas. And it's a topic that was discussed at a conference we ran just over the last few days in, in the city of Cluj in Romania. They have real problems. They're trying to build smart cities with the smallest number of um, miles of motorway infrastructure anywhere in Europe. Um, and, and these problems are solved by um, inputs from many different disciplines, I think. And, and I don't think that the learned societies are very good at, at sharing that. And we do tend to work within, our, within our, um, our clusters, particularly in social science. It may, may be less so in science. I, I couldn't speak for science. So the, then, um, just to put a finer point on this, then the psychologists, with their learned societies might be then a potential set of par par parties that um, you can work with, as well as, say, the urban planners. You can see that happening. So the, the Future of Cities program brought together a psychologist, a planner, an economic geographer, an architect, to try and answer some of these bigger questions. It, it is beginning well, to I happen. I think there's a thing, you know, that solving problems at global scale is often bringing together teams that are cross-disciplinary, sure. right? That's, 
And there are other problems. So this actually just goes back to the vertical and the horizontal, right? There are problems that can be solved and researched deeply, uh, vertically, and then, but some of the societal issues we're dealing with oftentimes require this kind of cross-disciplinary yeah. collaboration. And on the publishing side, actually, more and more as we look at innovative new uses for the content that we have, I, I'm interested in surfacing knowledge that goes across disciplines. So I got a, a big bug in my head about water recently because I wanted to see about you know, scarcity of water and how it relates to geoscience content and so forth. Um, but it goes back to what are the questions? So we're in growth of inquiry or mm. where we're putting resources to solve problems. Um, my sense is that oftentimes we need to look more broadly and actually within the way we've developed um, research resources, have we maximized our ability, for example, to analyze data across disciplinary categories? Mm. So I think that's actually a growth opportunity that perhaps we as a community have not sufficiently harnessed. Mm. So speaking of adjacent parties, partners, um, that could be potential partners, um, Kath, I guess I want to highlight that your organization is, while a federation, all representing the European region. Um, it is, in fact, there are some geographical boundaries that are, that are explicitly written out in your remit. What are your thoughts on you know, splitting the audiences from just the Europeans versus Asia versus the Americas, um, et cetera? How does your organization either compete or work with the learned societies also Elsewhere. in this space? <laughs> Yeah, so in terms of, well, we're international and European. So in terms of our membership, the societies are largely European, but it is already Europe and beyond. So we have uh, member societies from the Ukraine and Israel, um, et cetera. Um, so in terms of the members of member societies that can benefit from the um, services that we provide, then it is restricted. But our journals um, and uh, other acts at the Congress, for example, um, are completely international. So at the last Congress we just had in July, we had the, the second largest cohort was from South Korea. The first largest was from Spain, which was where the Congress was held. Um, so we aren't entirely restricted to Europe, but obviously we, we do have... Um, similar federations and similar organizations elsewhere. So for example, we, we do work somewhat um, with the American Society for Microbiology, um, but we're also working with ALAM, which is the sort of Latin American equivalent of FEMS. So I would say that historically, we've been sort of regionally um, divided but that increasingly as the world is changing, so is the way that these different groups of organizations are working together. What are the barriers to working closer together? Well, with uh, Latin America, it's, it's, it's language, so there's still a lot of um, Spanish language publishing um, in Latin America, and that's where I think most of the open access <laughs> content is in government-sponsored mm -hmm. journals, which publish in, in uh, Spanish and Portuguese. So that's a, it's a, it's a barrier for, for Latin America in the sense that many people can't read their content, um, but that's where they get the funding for to publish, and, and, and quite appropriately. So I don't think it's um, a situation that has a very simple solution, but it's one that, as a federation of um, societies with people in many different countries, we do have some language capability. Mm -hmm. So this is the sort of thing that we're looking at. Where do we deploy our diversity, which obviously has its limitations? If we do work for education, uh, it can work in the UK, it can work in America, but we have to translate it if it's going to work for any of the other of our member societies. Mm -hmm. But then this is the sort of area where we can sort of look and, s and see where we have an opportunity to bring in, uh, for example, Latin America. Sally, what type of barriers have you seen and experienced in trying to work with other parties, other learned societies? Oh, um My experience has been reasonably positive um, with most of the societies that we've done collaborations with, but we haven't done many. Um, they're, they're, as I've said several times, there really isn't a tradition in the social sciences, in especially perhaps in the UK, maybe it's different in other parts of the world. Um, where, the, um, where the aims are aligned, 
So um, if it's a, um, a conference on data and everybody's interested in it, then, then there are no problems. The problems come where there may be um, um, uh, competition over, over the volume of people you get there, how the money is divided, all of these normal sort of frictions to good partnerships. I think, I think the way to solve those is to, get the, is to get the values of the project right at the beginning. What are we trying to do here? What are the outcomes that we're looking for? What does success look like? And I think if you get those high-level questions right, then actually everything else falls into mm -hmm. place because you can always go back and say, yeah, this is, we can sort this out. Let's make sure we're concentrating on the, on the bigger gain here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, oftentimes it does seem like it's the matter of how much control one is accustomed to having yes. versus you know, yeah. how important that community goal yes. is, right? Exactly. And then having confidence in the pathway to success. Mm -hmm. But there's a yeah. lot of trust that needs to be cultivated in order to pursue that. And I think it also has to be kind of evidentiary in the sense that you, you continue to show that you have alignment and you have results. Um, but there is a, um, Tenora and I were talking yesterday about open-mindedness, about yeah. collaboration, and then how do you continue to reinforce that. But we all have, I think, you know, some, <laughs> some struggle with giving up um, some of the control, particularly if it's been in the tradition of our society, mm -hmm. right? I think where it helps is where you've got um, umbrella organisations like the Academy for Social Science, which is a safe space. So the societies collaborate very openly within the Academy. So we, we put on collective events, we put speakers up for, um, for policy, policy days and so on, and there's, there's literally no problem with that because that's a, a managed a managed space. That's, well, that's a good point, and I, I was going to follow up with you, Alex, as, um, well, G GSW is itself a neutral party, right, that is separate from your above or se yeah. separate from individual learned societies that you yes. work with. So you've seen some of the challenges, um, and you, your role is, in fact, to right. take away some of the challenges between these different learned societies who mm -hmm. may have competing mm -hmm. interests and getting them to cooperate. And it's changed a lot over time. I mean, the, the, st the history of GSW is really interesting because we were started by six founding societies. But I think, you know, that was, at the time, it was a really challenging idea. And I think there was a lot of tough politicking that went into getting that off the ground. And I think, you know, a lot of people could have other examples of things like that. Um, since I've, I joined in 11, so it's been about six years, and even in that time frame, I've seen attitudes shift so dramatically, right? Mm -hmm. And now, I, I mean, I could generally not be more pleased um, because I just think, but I think a lot of that is also because the world around us has changed. The drivers mm -hmm. for the societies have changed. Um, I think in the early days, they felt more like, you know, we should each be our own big gorilla and we don't really need this, you know? And, but then around that, it was the, but let's uplift a few of these mm -hmm. smaller people who maybe can't do it, but can't mm -hmm. digitize by themselves. Now we, now even the bigger of those societies, I think, feel vulnerable. I'd also say, and I see there's been a hand over there too, yeah. is I also feel like the activities that they're called upon to do are so much more layered and complex. So who can actually keep up with a lot of the intricacy of digital publishing? I think the other thing the societies struggle with, though, is to the degree that they're, Run, governed by volunteers, mm. um, when you know you're doing in some sectors of your business a very complex business, and that's why you reference commercial publishing. Well, mm. why would I want to do that myself? Our societies do do that themselves, yeah. but it doesn't mean that each individual society has to keep up with every aspect of that. Hi, I'm Pinar, I'm a founder of Acucoms, uh, not a publisher, a vendor to publishers. I find the panel incredibly inspiring and really connecting to what was discussed yesterday morning about collaboration. I think Sally mentioned something when she said that it's more about raising the difficult questions, getting together. And I, I see this um, from the published society's point of view. It's a very good balance to see societies um, who are for staying independent and societies who are happy publishing with a commercial pub, uh, publisher. I find it inspiring because I think we have to shift a little bit further um, and look at the matter of competition also um, from the vendor's side. 
and also from commercial publishers' side. Mike mentioned about Big Deal becoming bigger and big publishers are try trying to make it uncancelable. I think we all have to start thinking about how we can make um, content uh, u more useful, more interesting for libraries instead of thinking just how can I sell my content better mm -hmm. and find more money and take it away from other publishers. Uh, I think it's, it's more um, being bold what uh, Alex was talking about yesterday when someone asked you about what's a one, one single skill that we all have to have. I think we all have to be uh, bolder. Uh, Sally mentioned something about how difficult it was to raise the questions. I think we all should be able to understand that there's a, a lot of pride uh, in every one of us, in all our organizations. I don't think anyone will go into a group and say, hey, we haven't been doing this right. Can you, my competitor, help me think about this? And I don't think it's just a matter for societies and publishers, it's all of us. And I think we have to really start thinking about collaboration on a bigger scale and not be afraid of our competitors mm -hmm. and just be maybe silly enough to go to, to our competitors uh, and say, hey, can we, you know, I'm not really good at this, but I'm good at this. Can we do something more meaningful? And the big deal, can we bring more meaningful content to the libraries so that big deals might be cancelable? I think everything is cancelable, yeah. to be honest, if there's something better. Mm. That's what I just wanted to comment. It's really inspiring. Thank you. Any other follow-up notes? We are nearing the end of the time, so I want to encourage any audience comments or questions. So, well, let me end with this question, and um, let's, we, just to take the last minute or two. What are some of the things that you think a society should not give up um, in terms of the sticking points or compromises that may need to be made in the spirit of cooperation, <laughs> if there are any? I'll let you go first while I chew that over. <laughs> well, and I'd like to ask that out to the audience as well. It's, it's you know, because I'm not a society, so I, have, I can't answer that well enough. But my question would be, what are the things that you feel, if you, if you had a wide open field, um, where should you really deeply invest because no one can do it better than you can versus, you know, what else might be kind of shared, outsourced, and done other ways? I suppose my comments would be to turn that question a little bit on its head so, so it's less defensive. It's not really what I shouldn't g give it up. It, yeah. it, it builds mm. on what should what we do. What do I do, do best? And, yeah. and one of the things that, um, we, that I very often get approaches from commercial organisations um, is to take over the management of our membership. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite tempting sometimes because it, it, it does take up staff time and... But, but that's something that I would never give up. I can't see good reasons to give that up because if you lose that contact with your membership, um, those informal um, dialogues with your membership, um, that feeling of the lifeblood of what's happening, where are the pain points for different members in their career, um, what are th what's happening in, in Latin American regional studies, um, what's happened in Hungary with regional studies, where regional studies departments are being closed. Um, if you don't have that, that, that um, granular knowledge of what the world is like for your members, I think that's where a learned society begins to lose its path. And the other thing I, th I think we shouldn't lose is, our, um, is our, our approach to the support of our membership and to getting an impact from their work, so the promotion of our members. Mm -hmm. we've, we've seen that in GSW societies a lot, um, moving to education and workforce development, um, development of the science itself. There's a lot of domain specificity, just as I might say, you know, I have domain specificity over here. I certainly don't have the kind of domain specificity that the Geological Society of London has in their own, about their own content. Um, I may be able to connect people's domain knowledge across, you know, different societies. But that's where they need to continue through their authors and researchers to cultivate, you know, this is where we talk about the uplift of the science itself. The rest of it is facilitation or connecting the dots. 
Yeah, and I would say that bo both of, of the, um, the, t the discussions here are about networking. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. the scholarly society um, formed in order to um, promote mo mobility and exchange of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at the end of the day that that is our core business. You know, if, if you ask uh, somebody in a scholarly society what they do, they might talk about publishing, they might talk about events, blah, blah, blah. but at the end of the day, it's about um, scientific communication and networking. And then the new bit is about broadening that network in order that the scientific communication has impact. Yeah.